Good morning. Um, this is a case study carried out in northern Zambia, uh, and it was a case study that we identified when we were doing research on the, lo the social and local social and environmental impacts of biofuels, but the plantation um, had not yet been developed. There were only about 10 hectares or so cleared at the time that we first identified this case study, but we started thinking among ourselves, could we potentially look at the value of existing land uses, compare that with the value of employment, um, given what the company was paying at that time, and do a scenario analysis looking into the future. So this was a case study that was kind of put on hold for a year or two, and then we went back and, and, and actually did it um, about a year ago. Um, and so it's in a system where there's a shifting agricultural system called Chitameni, which helps us to explore this narrative about the marginality of lands being allocated for large-scale investments. Um, and with uh, two co-authors who are or have been with C4 in the past. Um, so Aaron covered some of the global trends, so I'm not going to go into much detail there. I just wanted to point out that in addition to the global dr market drivers, host countries, um, there's significant host country agency in terms of trying to attract investment uh, into particular country like Zambia, which is landlocked. Um, and maybe you know potentially more having more difficulty than other countries in attracting investment, um, but across the board in southern Africa, countries are offering a great deal to try to attract investors to their countries, uh, from tax benefits, uh, five to ten year uh, tax holidays, for example, and many other kinds of uh, tax benefits, uh, as well as legislative reforms, land tenure reforms. Um, and uh, business environment reforms, et cetera, to try to attract investors. And a number of narratives are, of course, leveraged in the context of these large-scale land acquisitions as a way to justify them. Some of them are focusing on the benefits, and others are focusing um, on minim you know, are narratives that, that in effect try to minimize the cost. Um, and this, tries, this paper looks at these narratives that, uh, that are essentially minimizing the cost by um, uh, saying that the lands being targeted for investment are in fact marginal, underutilized, or degraded. Uh, and in this particular uh, location, degraded lands can mean a number of different things, but it's often associated with er landscapes where fire has been used relatively intensively uh, for agriculture, for hunting, uh, for charcoal burning, etc. Um, and they also may be considered underutilized uh, in the context of itinerant yet land uses, in this case this uh, shifting agricultural uh, system. So to what extent are these lands in fact um, uh, marginal or underutilized? So just to contextualize this in the context of Zambia, um, there's been a host of investment pr promotion initiatives, as I talked about, uh, land policy reforms, facilitating long-term leasehold by foreigners. In this case, the leases are 99 years renewable. A uh, host of fiscal incentives that I've talked about. They also have established a land bank. A number of countries are doing this where they've uh, gone and negotiated with chiefs and basically um, have a, it's a database of, of land concessions that are made, you know, put on offer for investors who, who come. And the establishment of the Zambia Development Agency as a one-stop uh, one -shop, shop for investors. A number of countries are doing this as well, uh, basically trying to facilitate all of the permitting uh, land acquisition, et cetera, with, within one government agency to facilitate investment. Uh, they've also participated in a relatively significant way in the biofuel boom, uh, particularly with Jatropha, which um, uh, is largely being seen now as a failed crop. Um, but the country established blending targets uh, for ethanol as well as biodiesel. Uh, at the time of uh, research, when we were focusing on uh, biofuels back in 2009, more than 500,000 hectares had been acquired by, bio by investors for biofuel production, and more than 45,000 farmers had been engaged in outgrower schemes or contract farming schemes. Um, and there was a tendency to target, quote, marginal lands, uh, particularly in northern province, where a government agent, uh, actually a, uh, representatives of several government uh, departments were going around talking chiefdom by chiefdom negotiating land for investment is the way it was um, relayed to us. Um, and this area is where uh, this shifting agricultural system is most prevalent. So just to give a little bit of an introduction to land use in the province, uh, Chittimene agriculture is
is a little bit different than many other shifting agricultural systems where an area seven times larger than the actual resulting plot is is lopped branches are lopped it's not so you can see here there's um <coughs> there's uh, you know kind of large stumps left in this area and they're concentrated in a smaller area and burnt so it's essentially bringing uh, concentrating nutrients from a larger area into a smaller area for, for cropping um, and finger millet is the first crop that's uh, cultivated uh, it's a traditional crop with a, a number of uh, cultural values uh, and then followed by ground nuts cassava and then at the very end beans for as long as beans will produce one or two seasons and the benefits of the Chittimani system re relative to permanent fields is yield. Um, farmers were saying that if mature for forest is cut, it yields far, far more uh, per hectare than the permanent fields, but also cost. Households are not, um, of course, don't have to buy uh, expensive fertilizers uh, to make the system viable. Uh, finger millet was also stressed as a benefit that finger millet doesn't grow so well in the permanent cropland, so, that, so um, there's some uh, consequences there. Permanent fields have been promoted um, historically through uh, subsidies for maize cultivation. Um, and so the benefits are access to that subsidy, um, but also the de declining desirability of Chitameni as mature forests are more and more distance from, distant from households and also declining yields, uh, given uh, the tendency to be opening up uh, areas of younger vegetation over time. So the case study uh, was in Mpika district, and these are the five um, or six concession areas, totaling around 300,000 hectares. Uh, it's a mosaic landscape involving chitameni, permanent fields, and um, natural ve vegetation in various stages of uh, regeneration, including permanent uh, uh, mature forest. And we focused in on this concession here, where operations had initiated. Uh, on three villages which were on the boundaries of the concession. There are also two villages that are fully um, contained within the concession boundaries. But by doing it this way, we're able to look at the actual resource distributions within and outside of the plantation and also make some assumptions about what it would look like for villages that were fully encompassed within plantation boundaries. Uh, so we looked at livelihood impacts under alternative plantation development scenarios. Uh, the first being that only Chitameni farmland would be uh, displaced and the permanent crops would remain. This is the official company policy at the time. Um, but since uh, even in the very early stages where 10, 15 hectares were cleared, some two farmers had indicated that their, that their permanent croplands had been displaced. And so we went ahead and looked at the other scenario where both, um, both uh, types of cropland are displaced. So the scenario analysis looked at essentially eight scenarios, which I'm going to present in very um, distilled format, that, um, defined by the company strategy. So um, scenario one, only chitameni is displaced. Scenario two, all vegetation or land uses are displaced. And then we looked at all livelihood activities, the case where all livelihood activities are within concession boundaries, representing those two communities that are fully encompassed by the concession area, and then it, actual resource distributions for those boundary communities, where which resources are found inside versus outside the concession area. Um, and then under scenarios of employment and no employment. So that's to say, you know, looking at household averages, what's the consequence if, you know, only my Chitameni fields are displaced and I do get employment versus I don't get employment. And that was looked at for all the different scenarios. So what's the baseline look at look like before um, a concession comes in or um, a large scale uh, agricultural investment? Uh, the current land holdings, uh, f first of all, we didn't find any households wh who were solely focused on Chitameni agriculture. Uh, we found people who are practicing permanent cropping exclusively and those who are pr practicing both Chitameni and permanent cropping. Uh, but interestingly, those who practice both had larger uh, area of permanent cropland uh, in addition to their Chittimani fields and um, we, we weren't able to figure to distill why that was the case but in any case it's not that just the poor, poorer households are practicing Chittimani in the system. Uh, the income derived from diverse livelihood activities, uh, permanent cropland it, as compared to Chittimani crops generates far more of the household's uh, income on average. However, the Chittimani cropland is within a system 
uh, involving natural uh, vegetation in various stages of regeneration, as I mentioned, um, as well as uh, our areas that are used for livestock grazing. So the assumptions we made in terms of looking at the Chitamini system were to consider the non-timber forest products as part of that system and only 50% of the livestock component as part of that system. Um, and so you see there's just, just so, um, so the implication of that is that um, this component, these two components here are relevant for the households who also only practice permanent cropping because they're, they're also collecting non-timber forest products. So moving on to findings, um, the first uh, table looks at all where all livelihood activities are located within concession boundaries, representing those two communities that are inside the concession area, and where only Chitameni is displaced. So this is kind of the, the best case scenario for those uh, communities. And you see that Ch Ch Chitameni farmers are, if you consider the consumptive value of um, all the resources in their system, they're actually earning more than they would earn uh, if all households were in fact em employed, which I've never witnessed in practice. Um, but in this case, there were 18 households employed at the time of research. It's impossible to look to know what that would look like or look like over time as far as percentages. Um, but um, and then for non chitamini farmers, uh, there would be a gain through employment if that employment could be guaranteed. So it depends on their current livelihood strategies what the net effect would be. Um, looking at the case where if all land uses or vegetation were displaced by this company or in other, by other companies in, in um, similar landscapes, um, you see here that <coughs> the annual income from employment is about this. And this, by the way, this was a uh, wage labor that people were very, very happy with. Uh, and we were able to look at a number of different large scale um, plantations and they were paying far more than others were paying at the time. So it's a fairly generous um, estimate. Um, but if you look at all the consumptive value as well as the cash value, which is here, um, you see that um, you know if uh, that basically employment cannot offset economic losses when you consider those consumptive values. If you're only looking at cash value, then you then the, the answer would be yes, it would offset um, those losses. And the final table um, is looking at existing resource distribution. So each boundary community here in the left-hand column and uh, looking at the actual distributions of resources within and outside co concession boundaries. And I just want to point out here that there's a very different um, dependency on uh, resources within versus outside concession boundaries based on uh, local landforms, the uh, distribution of, of uh, non-timber forest products. It, there's a high, uh, highly heterogeneous distribution. And also in this particular community where you see most of um, most of the, or a much higher percentage of resources found within concession boundaries, um, it was because there was a river that was basically blocking access to the other side of the community. So they're very highly dependent on uh, resources within the concession. And so the net, looking at the net household impact, if you're, they're not employed, of course, there's losses for, for everyone, but anywhere between 5% and 86% of their livelihoods uh, were you know, displaced from inside the concession area. And then um, the net household impact, if uh, considering employment, was variable and it very much depended on which village you came from and how those resources were distributed. <coughs> so since this table is very dense, I just um, thought I'd distill a few bullets from it. Um, so there's sig significant net losses in the absence of employment, of course, for land or resource losing households, irrespective of the land occupation scenario. Uh, it's obvious. Um, and, I, and we have yet to see any any situation, we've been looking at these large-scale land acquisitions where communities have been able to negotiate employment for land-losing households, um, it, you know, for all land-losing households. There's, a, there's often a generic commitment that, yes, we will employ local people, um, but never talks of, you know, in terms of numbers or percentages. And uh, one of this, uh, the concessions we looked at in Ghana, only 4% of displaced households were employed. So this is a really important thing to uh, be looking at when looking at the impacts on local people. Um, there's significant intervillage differences based on variable landforms and heterogeneous uh, forest product distribution, which shape whether there are net economic gains or losses. So these distribution, um, these patterns of resource dis distribution are very much important in, in shaping outcomes. And with employment guarantees for displaced households, uh, net gains cannot be guaranteed when considering consumptive values and should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, I'm not seeing, we're not seeing cases where 
um, local um, environmental impact assessments are actually quantifying the, the anticipated effects. It's a, a lot of, you know, you know, kind of qualitative assessments of benefits that will come relative to costs, but um, not a whole lot of quantification. Uh, just to, so I figured I'd, I'd um, do the disclaimers last. Um, a few shortcomings uh, in the quantification of consumptive values for NTFPs. Uh, NTFPs that have no market value, such as thatch for roofing and and other and uh, and um, I think we also left out firewood, were not quantified in those um, estimates. Um, but the NTFPs that do have a market value, all of the the harvested volumes were considered to be sold. And so that could have inflated or, um, or reduced the, the estimates there. And the study does not try to capture non-economic or indirect impacts. And that's, of course, a huge um, issue when you know all these um, uh, unanticipated effects on gender, etc. Uh, but there's one interesting finding is that, um, that in one of the focus group discussions, where women said that they brewed beer from finger millet and then they used that, especially um, single uh, female-headed households, used that to pay for male labor to establish their uh, farming plots. And so this loss of finger millet from the system is could potentially have um, some important consequences. So uh, going back to the questions, um, the mar you know, are these lands in fact marginal that are being targeted for investment in Zambia? Um, well, first, most house households continue to rely significantly on a Chitamani system for cash income and subsistence, even in the more degraded areas targeted for investment, and also even for those households who do not practice Chitamani agriculture. They're, um, the, they're, uh, at, at the first table I showed, or the second table, um, showed that they're actually also highly uh, dependent on this system. Uh, employment matters, but is often insufficient to offset losses. Uh, highly heterogeneous landscapes mean highly uncertain effects, and um, so you know these narratives of certainty. Um, really, we need to be very cautious about that. And anticipated lively effects should be quantified, even in the most degraded environments, to justify the development claim accompanying land acquisition narratives. So, thanks.